Well, hi, this is Robert Cahoon on The Pulse, and I am really blessed to have a second week talking with uh, Francis Hogan. If you haven't listened to the first interview with Francis Hogan, please do go back and listen to that first interview. It was absolutely fantastic. Uh, uh, just a very quick recap before we get into part two of this interview. Um, Francis was born in the middle of the Second World War, the fifth child in a family of nine. She told us all about her childhood, her father, who was a, um, a bus driver of kissing a tabernacle in the church, um, seeing Jesus is uh, superimposed on the face of her father, as well as going to boarding school and getting into scripture at a very young age with uh, meeting uh, Monsignor Boylan, the local priest at age 10, saying that she had a desire to be taught scripture. Um, she then entered a religious life in 1959, just before the storm of the, the Second Vatican Council, the Kelisandra Sisters, a missionary order, you know, joined them for 14 years, uh, had an incredible habit and was uh, challenging, challenging f formation um, with uh, religious life at that time, just before, uh, just before the 1960s. But the first place she was sent was to, to Nigeria, where there was certainly a war going on in, in Nigeria at the time, it was quite dramatic. And she had to leave, uh, had to leave Nigeria. Um, very, uh, an extraordinary story that Francis told us going down, going down a, a river um, from Nigeria to escape the country as the war situation deteriorated. She also spent uh, many years in Cameroon um, with some wonderful missionary experiences, teaching science, and then also chances of teaching theology as well. A wonderful experience of meeting a Simeon-like figure in the bush in Cameroon as well. So plenty of um, stormy weather and stormy roads as well in, in Cameroon. Um, also had an extraordinary meeting with uh, somebody uh, who was St. Maximilian Kolbe. And at this point, she came back to Ireland and spent some time in a hospital. And then at this point came out of religious life and felt a calling to teach scripture in a, teach scripture as a lay person in the world. And this really gets us to part two of part two of the interview. So Francis, um, Francis, how are you today? And I, I hope I haven't butchered the, for the first explanation of just a very quick summary, um, summary of our first interview. I hope that wasn't too bad there. So okay. just a very quick summary. Um, so we've got to, we've got to the second part, uh, the second part of this interview as well. And um, you mentioned, so you've, you've left uh, the security of the convent of religious life and you've sort of come back into living as a lay person in the world. And um, you, you described some of that as the, the dark night of the soul. Um, you, you've also said that, that's, uh, that it was a, uh, having a no place to lay your head, uh, kind of a sort of purgatory on earth. Um, was this kind of a, a self-emptying experience? Um, what, what was this experience like being a lay person back in the world, having given your whole life to uh, whole life to religious life, poverty, chastity, obedience, and then suddenly having to leave all that and, and start all over again? And um, what was that experience like? And that, that lasted sort of seven years, did it, after, after leaving the convent? Very simply, it was horrific. <laughs> <laughs> Very few people. Uh, get themselves into a situation where they have no reference points. Uh, there was no connection between the world I had come out of and the world I was going into. Uh, I had literally no reference point. Nobody could help me. I was a complete, um, how do you put it, mystery to everybody. My family couldn't cope. Uh, in the eyes of society in those days, uh, if you left religious life, you were uh, the definition of a failure. Um, and uh, so if you had failed so completely in one way of life, how on earth are you going to make anything of another one? Um, so uh, it was horrendous. I mean, I had no friends, no contacts, nothing. I had nowhere to live. I had nothing. But the dark night of the soul didn't begin there. The dark night of the soul began in Africa and it came to its uh, fullness uh, in this experience because the Lord was preparing me all the time for a, uh, what I call my real vocation, 
which was to be a lay missionary and to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. But the experience of being in a religious community was actually vital. Uh, I don't think I would have survived uh, the life that I'm living um, unless I'd had the, the training and the discipline uh, that I found in religious life. Um, that was terribly, terribly important. You know, I just, I just wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have made it. Um, you'd give up rather easily. Um, and people just uh, expected, as soon as I left religious life, that you'd get married and settle down. Well, who needs to marry somebody who has no reference point? <laughs> Literally cannot cope with where they've landed. It was the same as if I had landed on Mars. I mean, there was nothing. I, I had no idea how to, to deal with uh, but what was so completely difficult was that my way of thinking was as different from everybody around me as somebody from Mars arriving on planet Earth. I had just no way of uh, reaching the way they were thinking. And what people expected of me, I just couldn't do. It was just not possible. Uh, so people just said, well, get married and settle down and do something decent. I thought trying to do the will of God was the most decent thing you could do. Um, but with regard to the dark night of the soul, uh, I had been living a prayer life from the time I was a child. Uh, and um, it was the Carmelite saints that I made uh, sent for me. And so I studied uh, St. Therese and St. John of the Cross. Uh, not Teresa of Avila as much, although I did read her writings. She didn't affect me as much as the other two. Um, and John of the Cross tells us that um, if we're serious about life, and if we're serious in any way about our relationship with God, <clears throat> that God has two levels of purification that he gives to us. A purification is a purgatorium in Latin, so it's, your, it's purgatory. And it means that you are being prepared for a union with God. And we call it union with God when we're on earth. And we call it heaven when we have found God finally uh, in eternity. And we have to be purified of all our faults and failings and all the, the flotsam and jetsam that makes up uh, um, human life uh, and all the wrong thinking of the past and if you've held on to hurt or bitterness or anything like that everything's got actually dealt with and uh, saint john of the cross says that uh, the first dark night of the soul is given to everybody everybody and it's made up of the ordinary uh, trials and difficulties and challenges of everyday life no matter what your way of life is whether you're religious or lay it doesn't make any difference <clears throat> only difference that is made is whether you're open to God or not. And if we handle the, the difficulties of everyday life uh, properly, the Lord will teach us. And if you talk to mature adults, um, and I know lots and lots and lots of uh, lay people who are real saints in my opinion, um, mm -hmm. and, in, and, and in every country I've ever been in as well, it's, it's just beautiful to meet them. Uh, you'll find that they have been brought from these negatives, you know, uh, anger and bitterness and unforgiveness and all this stuff, which is the source of all illness. And they've been brought uh, through forgiveness and letting it go right to a life of tranquility and peace and what I call maturity. Um, <clears throat> that first night of the soul is for everybody. And so, you know, having lived in a country uh, where there was a war and all that goes with it. Uh, if that doesn't do it, nothing will. Uh, you had a extraordinary experience. Um, well, lots of great stories, really amazing stories. And one of them was you were in a car and you were traveling up to Northern Ireland and you got in trouble with the law. Uh, you, you started speaking to a British soldier and somebody noticed you. And I think after that, the, the car was stolen for a bank robbery or something like that. Uh, would you be able to tell us that story? Oh, yes. Um, yeah. uh, I'm, I have never ceased to be a missionary. I'm a missionary at heart. It's just that I'm not wearing clerical garb at all. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, as soon as I got going at all, uh, and I got to the stage of being able to buy a car, I had to go and get a job to do that. Uh, and um, 
I uh, was doing a, a lot of work in the north of Ireland when the so-called troubles broke out. And that didn't make any difference to me. A human being is a human being. Uh, and I was doing a lot of work in England and I couldn't, couldn't for the life of me see that the people there or the people here could be our enemy. That, that, I, I'm not politically savvy anyway. Uh, so I continued working and on a particular Saturday morning, uh, I set out for the north of Ireland. I was going to give a seminar in a Protestant church up in the really northern part of north of Ireland, right up nearly at the, at the Atlantic. And I, I don't want to name it because this is a public interview. And um, anybody else who would take notice of the weather that morning would have stayed at home. But I was young and I was enthusiastic. And there was freezing fog in Ireland. And I still drove up to the north of Ireland. So when I came to the border, I was the only car passing by at 8.30 in the morning. Madness. Uh, because I was speaking at 10 o'clock up in this place. I only discovered when I arrived that they weren't expecting me. <laughs> <laughs> because they thought I would do what anybody else would do, is stay at home in freezing fog. But never mind. <clears throat> anyway, I had a skid, which meant that I it was a bit of damage on the car. But when I arrived at the border, there was only one um, British soldier at the, at the border. He was a young guy, he was only about 18. And he looked really scared at this car arriving because, I mean, they weren't expecting anything on that particular morning because of the weather. And anyway, so I slowed the car down and I pulled the window down. And I told him that I was a missionary and I didn't consider any human being on the planet an enemy. They were all friends. And um, <clears throat> told him I was doing a lot of work in England <laughs> anyway, you know. And we, he eventually put the gun down on the ground. It was a big, huge thing. Uh, and we had a great chat, the two of us. And I talked to him about, you know, really trusting God in these terrible circumstances he found himself in. And I also told him that I thought it was an absolute disgrace that his government would put an 18 year old in a situation like this. I said, it's not fair. That's not fair. Because I mean, you could die at any moment. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, I drove on. The folks in, uh, in, in the church that I was going to didn't think I would turn up because of the weather and they were utterly amazed that I did and we had a, a great day and eventually anyway got home <clears throat> Monday morning before I, I set out for class for my school uh, the police arrived and told me that I was responsible for a bank robbery and hit and run accident and uh, that it was a 15 year jail sentence <laughs> I thought they were being funny. <laughs> I know the police are not funny at 8 30 in the morning. I understand that. But I have family in the in the police, so I thought somebody was playing a trick on me. I said, no, you can't be serious. And then of course they had to put on their official thing and you know. <clears throat> Why did you come to me? And they said, it's your car, and the damage is on your car all the evidence is that you're guilty. I thought, holy heavens, what do you do now? I said to them, look, can I tell you something? <clears throat> I have a brother-in-law who's a sergeant in the police. Would you ever go to him? I said, because if I had done anything wrong, I said, I would go to him immediately. I said, go and talk to him. And I said, <clears throat> And I'll go and talk to somebody who can tell you where I was at the time when you say this accident happened and so on. And uh, so they, they followed me for the whole day and they, they sat outside the school while I was teaching and everything. I think the students thought I was getting interesting. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> anyway, it, it, what actually happened was that the IRA were watching and, you know, it was a crime in their eyes that you would speak to a British soldier as their enemy. And uh, <clears throat> so then the punishment was 15 years in jail for you, you see. So then they, they photographed my car, stole a car, put a false number plate on it, used it uh, in a bank robbery and hit and run accident so that I would pay the price for having spoken 
as a Christian to another Christian on a Saturday morning. <laughs> what, what an extraordinary story. Um, yeah, but there was a sequel. <laughs> Go on, yeah. Not the sequel. Yes, please, yeah. Some years later, uh, I was asked to give um, a retreat in Port Leisha Jail, which is our only um, top security prison in Ireland. And I gave a whole morning of retreat to the IRA. And um, the guards, uh, the people who run the prison thought I was absolutely mad. Um, I said, no, no, I need to talk to these guys. And I went into this room and it was full of them. And the guards were sort of behind uh, glass screens to make sure nothing went wrong, like them killing me, like, you know. <laughs> and I said to them, gentlemen, I have a, a message for you. They've never met me before. What do you mean you've got a message? I, you see, they boasted that none of their victims ever got away. And so I said, take a deep breath. I'm going to tell you something very important. And I said, I'm your victim risen from the dead. Well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe the response I got. It was absolute shock. Absolute shock. <laughs> the guards thought I really, really should be locked up. <laughs> And after that, it was absolutely fantastic. I was able to talk to them about God. I was able to really get around them. It was incredible what happened afterwards. I said, I'm not coming to you in anger. I said, I'm coming to bring you the love of God. I said, I'm coming to bring you forgiveness. I said, I forgive the whole lot of you. And they were completely unmanned. It was incredible. <laughs> Brilliant. There was another trip to prison where you mentioned uh, Moses had killed somebody and that God had used him really powerfully. Was that another trip to was that another trip to prison? Oh, it was. Yeah, that was yeah. that was a, a prison in another country okay. uh, where I was um, visiting uh, men who were considered the most violent uh, of their prisoners, all on very long sentences and everything. And again, I was told I was completely off my head visiting them. I love visiting prisons. I love talking to prisoners because I told you in the first interview that the Lord was going to give me a captive audience, didn't I? Yeah. I've always loved them, always loved them. And the incredible thing is that a person picks up instantly whether you like them or not. Mm -hmm. uh, a prisoner will pick up instantly whether you're coming on an official visit or whether a real person is coming to actually visit them. Oh. And I was able to communicate all the time that I loved them. And um, I, I always prayed a lot before I would visit a prison. Um, and in, in this particular case, uh, the Lord told me to dress as attractively as possible. But why? And he said, they haven't seen anything beautiful for years. Oh, yeah. Human being cannot survive without beauty. Go and bring them touch of my beauty. I said, absolutely. And the other thing he said was, please don't consider yourself better than them. If you consider yourself better, I can't use you at all. I want you to go with an open heart, he said, and I will use you powerfully. So an absolutely extraordinary thing happened because uh, I, I was only allowed into the prison at a particular moment. They, they were allowed 30 minutes out of their cells in 24 hours. Can you imagine? They want to truly destroy a human being, just lock them up. We were made for freedom. And uh, these people were considered uh, so violent that they had two guards on each prisoner. And the Lord did something absolutely incredible. Only he could do it. Uh, they, the people bringing me in, and I went in also with the chaplain, uh, they asked me to stand at a particular point in which there was glass all around me. And I was on a kind of a platform looking down 
uh, and I could see the prisoners coming out of their cells. But just at the moment when they were out of their cells and they could see me for the first time, a ray of sunshine absolutely illuminated the whole place. And I got this <gasps> reaction from them all. <laughs> they thought they were seeing vision. <laughs> the poor vision you're getting but never mind <laughs> the lord really used it and so i invited them to come and, and uh, share with me for a while and <clears throat> out of the whole lot of them i got about 20 and brought them into this room and uh now every one of them had committed murder um and with uh, additional problems uh, added to it uh and i said to them do you know that God sent me to talk to you. And they said, no, 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 no. No, God would never talk to us. If the guards don't talk to us, I said, never mind the guards. I said, God wants to talk to you. I said, he sent me to talk to you. What God want to say to us? I said, um, what do you call this place? They said, hell. I said, he wants me to ask you, would you like it forever? And I heard in one corner, good God, no. I said, okay. Since you don't want it forever, do you want to know how to avoid it forever? Do you want to go somewhere else that's nice? I said, somewhere where you can be happy just for once. He said, but is that even possible for people like us? And I said, yeah. And they couldn't get it. So I said to them, have you ever heard of Moses? They said, of course, everybody's heard of Moses. I said, did anybody tell you he committed murder? They said, no. I said, he did. He committed murder when he was young. But he didn't stay there. He went off into a desert and he allowed God to purify him. And then he allowed God to use him. And he became one of the greatest men who ever lived. But he didn't start as one of the greatest men who ever lived. I said, you've done the same thing as Moses. You've killed somebody. Now you're in the desert of this place. Why don't you let God purify you so that you can actually become somebody great? Their eyes nearly fell out of their heads. Why did somebody else ever say that? I said, I don't know. I said, it's too obvious. And it was, it, was, it was fantastic what happened. Uh, and so I, I talked to them and I said, you know, there, there's baby lessons you have to learn now in order to get free. And I said, you can practice on each other because you're all considered to be bad. <laughs> <laughs> I said, they said, what are we to practice? And I said, practice being nice <laughs> and practice forgiveness. The guards thought I was off my head. Anyway, <clears throat> at the end of this, I was only allowed 30 minutes and we were getting through so fantastically that even the two guards that were with us were really fascinated in what was going on. And uh, when it came to the 30 minutes, I just looked at the guards and I did that. <laughs> Don't do that. And there was great peacefulness among them all. And uh, so I managed to get another 10 minutes for them. And you know, those men absolutely loved me for gaining an extra 10 minutes for them. Nobody had ever done that. I said, I'd keep you longer if I was allowed. But I said, they want to throw me out, unfortunately. And I said, would you like me to pray with you? Instantly, they lined up, every one of them. And these hands that had violently attacked and killed somebody else, I took them into my hands and held them until they warmed and loved them through their hands and bless them. And each one of those men began to cry and walk back all by themselves to their cells in total peace. The guards were absolutely shocked. Anyway, <clears throat> at the end of that, the priest said to me, we're late for the church. <laughs> I didn't care. <laughs> A miracle going on here. I didn't <laughs> care what was happening anywhere else on the planet. So uh, we arrived back at the church anyway, and the congregation was sitting there getting fed up, waiting for this speaker to turn up, you know. <laughs> and, uh, 
I walked straight up the church, up to the embo, up to the congregation, and I said, the most fantastic thing is happening in this prison. I said, start praying for them. We've just been in the prison. And I, I was talking to them like this, all excited. And I said, how do we intercede for them? God's going to work an incredible miracle there. <laughs> they thought I was off my head. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, by the end of that week, the priest said to me, don't you want to know what happened? I said, you're going to tell me. He said, those men you spoke to were the most incredible missionaries I ever met. They went to every cell in the prison and they told them verbatim what you told them. He said, I've never heard so many sincere, humble confessions in my entire life. Wow, absolutely amazing. So um, moving on from the prisons, um, you also were a teacher at this point in your life as well. You taught in a school and there was some kind of hostility towards faith by some of the pupils there. So, um, you know, it might have been slightly similar to that, to the prison experience you, you mentioned. Um, but you also had kind of like a breakthrough experience with the girls that you taught when you asked them if they had met God. And, and how did you get through to the kind of pupils where there was a hostility to faith? Um, can you mention showing the pro-life film in school and then it became quite secular in schools and you decided to sort of stop teaching at that point. So um, we kind of move on to the teaching part of your, uh, of your life now. It's an awful lot easier to talk to prisoners. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they can tell if you're genuine. They're, they're, they're I, I, yeah. I was teaching in a secondary school and it, they, they, they came from a, a wealthy background, so they were spoiled. Uh, and um, it was fashionable not to believe, but there was a crisis of faith going on as well. And uh, I was getting a lot of opposition and uh, I was the head religion teacher in the school. Uh, I mm -hmm. taught science as well, taught uh, chemistry and biology as well. And uh, the girls told me that I taught more religion through chemistry and biology than anything else. I said, yeah, because this is my my stamping ground. <laughs> this is where I work. Um, I would never actually go into their class to teach them religion without laying hands on the door and praying, asking the angels to come with me and asking the angels to fill the room and engaging their guardian angels as well. Because uh, after all, young people are up against the crisis that's in the, the older generation. Um, and um, anyway, it, it came to a head at one point where one of the girls stood up and she said, I reject you, I reject your God, I reject your Bible, I reject your religion, I reject everything and went on and on like this. And uh, I just gave my mayday sign to the Lord. I have a secret mayday sign that I give him. And I just waited. And then very quietly I said to her, I don't have a God of my own. There is only one God, and he's for everybody. doesn't matter who you are. He's even for you, I said to her. And I said, I don't have a church of my own. There's a church there for absolutely everybody. I said, could you imagine somebody having a church of their own? I said, I don't have a Bible of my own. It went on and on like this anyway. And so the others didn't like this, and, and they were firing negativity at me. The final thing was, have you ever met God anyway? I said, yes, I have. And the shock effect was unbelievable. Because they'd only met teachers that didn't really believe. And uh, teachers who didn't have a prayer life and teachers who didn't have a personal experience of God. And for the first time, somebody says, yes, I have met him. It, it, the change in the room. First of all, it was complete silence. And then when they got their breath back, they said, tell us about it. And they changed completely. And from that moment, I never taught a class in an official way. Uh, I never taught religion in an official way again. I said, come out of your desks. I said, come up and sit around me. You can sit on the floor if you like, or just bring up stools or whatever you want. Just sit around me and I'll talk to you as another human being. And then I gave them the testimony of how I had met the Lord. And from then on, they were eating out of my hands. Uh, but when I wanted to 
teach them about the sacredness of life. Uh, in, particularly in biology, there's an awful lot to, to um, teach young people and if biology mm -hmm. is taught to them with sacredness, everything's fine. But it has to be given with sacredness. Uh, and uh, I showed them a film of the developing embryo. Didn't show a man, didn't show a woman. I just simply showed a developing embryo and I said, I want to talk about this miracle from one cell to this incredible being. And if you don't believe in miracles, just watch this and you'll see, this is an unbelievable miracle. And that's all I showed them. And at the end of it, I said, you have the incredible privilege of being able to do that. And they, I'm only summarizing it. Um, mm -hmm. in, the, in the end, one of the girls stood up and she said, I guarantee you, she said, no girl in this class will ever abort. I said, I hope not. You couldn't possibly destroy something so beautiful. Wow. So that's the way I used to kind of teach them religion. Mm. Uh, and they used to say I, I taught them more, as I say, either in biology or chemistry than, than I did, simply because they were more open through those channels. It was less challenging to receive through those channels than it was for a direct a teaching they found very confrontational. Uh, and then I, I pulled them out of school and uh, taught them in different circumstances. Uh, and when I pulled them away from the cool school system, yes, they could hear. And the schools, <laughs> the schools became more and more secular over time, didn't, oh. didn't they? So you, at some point you decided not to carry on with teaching. Very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> After a year of teaching in, in Dublin, I said, no, I'd rather starve. Uh, than teach I would, and I wouldn't go back again to school for any reason uh, and what <clears throat> I felt the Lord was saying to me was teach the teachers there was, there was a, 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 the, sorry there was a conflict between the teachers and the pupils as well could you mention that and you tried to reconcile no I want uh, to tell you I want to tell you this the Lord yeah. said to me teach the teachers mm -hmm. the children will not have a problem if the teachers are okay teach the parents because the children won't have a problem if the parents are okay. And so uh, he turned my direction completely towards the adult population because if the adults are okay, the children will be okay. So that was the orientation that the Lord gave to me. But the teachers thought I was completely crazy, but I'm used to people telling me I'm crazy and it's so, okay. And there, there was a com conflict in the school between the pupils and the teachers, and you tried to reconcile that conflict. Yeah, it was a complex situation, but uh, I, it ended up with the, the teachers wanting to expel the girls who were going to do their, their leaving certificate, their final exam. It was incredible. Um, <clears throat> and when I realized what the teachers were going to do, I went down to the senior class and I said to them, uh, I was teaching them religion, of course, and I was teaching them biology and chemistry as well. I said, listen, I'm not coming to you as a teacher. I'm coming to you as a human being. I said, I want you to know that they want to expel you from the school. Don't let them do it. They're not going to lose anything. You're going to lose everything. I said, you've got to get a little bit of humility and uh, put your heads together get a team together, go up and negotiate. I said, because you alone are going to uh, lose in this situation. And I, I talked with them until we, we got the, the team together. And I said, go up by yourselves. I said, I'm not going to be there. I'm going to slip away. <laughs> It'd be too obvious who was who would get to see. So I said, I'll go and tell the head teacher what I've done. <clears throat> I said, but you go on your own. And before I left the school, they had gone up to negotiate. I said, just keep in mind that you alone are going to lose out. And before I left the room, they said to me, we've never met a teacher like you, someone who actually treated us 
as other and other adults. I said, I actually care about you. I said, I've told you I cared about you, but you didn't believe me. And um, they, they worked it out. But I went to the head teacher and I told her what I had done. I said, get up to the staff room. They, the girls are on their way up. I said, and I'm leaving because it'll be too obvious that I'm the guilty one. I'm the one that brought the two sides together. Um, but I handed in my notice after that because I wanted to go to the adults. And I've gone to adults ever since. So uh, you started teaching as a lay missionary, teaching scripture. How did that get started? And did that involve a surrender to God? Um, uh, what, what was happening in religious life at the time? This is post-Vatican II kind of, you know, liberal sort of uh, decline craziness at the time as well. So this is kind of a new stage of uh, your life, teaching scripture um, post-teaching post in a school. Well, there's kind of two prongs to it. <clears throat> one was that uh, the Lord wanted me to go around all the religious communities, particularly the communities of women, and uh, teach them scripture um, because a crisis was coming, which came. Uh, <clears throat> and at the same time, I said to him, how will I start with parents? If you ask God a question, he's going to give you the most obvious answer. The answer is staring you in the face, is what he's trying to tell you. He said, gather a few of them in your own home. Start from there. And if you start small, it will develop. Very, very quickly it developed. And uh, I began teaching through uh, charismatic prayer groups uh, because adults were now gathering together for prayer. Uh, and I would go and teach them the scriptures for uh, about a half an hour. Uh, and that was my interest in the thing. I wasn't particularly interested in the whole experience. I just wanted to uh, teach scripture. And that became sort of an, an outlet for me to uh, contact more and more and more adults. Um, and at the same time, <clears throat> it's a three pronged thing. At the same time, um, I said to the Lord, you want me to take the gospel to the ends of the earth? Uh, this is rather close to home. I said, I'll show you, I'll show you. And uh, I got an invitation from a friend in England uh, who just simply said, uh, come and take a week off and rest. And she had some uh, friends in high places who uh, had clout with the, the bishops and got me an invitation to work in the parishes. That's how it all started in Britain. Uh, and I ended up uh, going from parish to parish for quite a number of years uh, and diocese uh, to diocese as well uh, when you when you let god do something it's actually very simple uh, when we do things it's very complex and uh, religious life was changing quite a lot at this time they started watching television in some of the convents so you started to teach in some of the religious houses but then that that situation changed over time yeah, I don't particularly want to go down this route, sure, uh, sure. but um, uh, there was great apostasy in the church in the 80s and 90s uh, and uh, a massive change after Vatican Council. Uh, and the, the, the ones who were affected the most initially were the priests and the religious. I was very much involved working with, with both. Um, and... Um, by the time I'm talking now, and the time I had entered the convent back in 59, uh, there was a massive change. Um, and it was not like the, 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 the way of life that I had actually joined. <clears throat> and so it became quite worldly and uh, they uh, allowed television in. If you bring television in and you're watching television at night, you are not praying at 6.30 in the morning. It's actually that simple because they're two contrary worlds. And whatever you go to bed with in your head is what's in your head first thing in the morning. And so it had always been the tradition of the church that you prayed before you went to bed uh, and that you, you um, brought your life around into contact, uh, centered on the Lord. And you went to, 
you went to bed that way. So you were able to get up and pray, you were in the right context. But if, if the, the world has invaded you um, just before you go to bed, that's what's in your head. Uh, and so uh, the, the prayer life really suffered because of that. And then they got involved in a lot of new age stuff as well. And I tried to do what I could to stop it, but I couldn't. Hmm. Uh, you've got an, another fantastic story about uh, the, the man who wanted to stay in jail um, so that he could finish his exams and he deliberately robbed you in, in order that he could stay in jail to, to finish his exams. And you, you did, uh, I think, it, was it in your first house? You, you had an unpleasant spirit in one of the first houses as well. Can you uh, tell those two, two stories? Uh, the one about the young man I, I love because he was just, yeah. uh, um, he was only about somewhere between 19 and 20 uh, from a very uh, deprived background. And it was because he was in jail, uh, he was allowed to study and he was ready to do his final exam. But then his time in jail was up and the, and the law says you leave, so you leave. It was absolutely cruel. They should have left him to do his exams because then he could get a job and be rehabilitated. Uh, so. I was sharing a house with um, two other women at the time. And so he robbed us. Only one of the women had anything you could um, be interested in. I had nothing you'd be interested in. Um, and uh, he was caught rather easily. And uh, uh, when it came to the court case, um, uh, he said, I, I don't remember the, the details awfully clear at this moment. Um, but he said he only did it because he wanted to get back into jail to do his leaving certificate, his final exam. And I remember the judge who was a woman saying, have we come to this? This is, this is frightening, you know, that a young man, he should have been allowed to do his exam out of compassion and then he'd be rehabilitated. Um, but uh, the, the, the friend that he actually stole the stuff from happened to be a lawyer <laughs> and she wanted to defend him in court I said no you can't do that it's not possible you're the victim and she said put him in jail let him do his exam afterwards we will rehabilitate and so we actually took him under our wing because it's lovely yeah because all you have to do is look at a person as a person. If you look at a person as a criminal, you, you, they've had it. Right. Yeah, that's <laughs> a, a theme that's coming through a lot of these interviews of uh, a lot of these questions is, is when you treat people as, you people. Know, as people, whether it's prison, whether it's school, uh, exactly. whether it's teaching scripture, you know, that's uh, exactly, you, you'll get a good response from them. So yes, yeah, so you just treasure um, the other person as person. That's right. Yeah. And so you, was it your first house uh, in Dublin? There was an unpleasant spirit in the house. Did you have a kind of exorcism in the house or um, what, what happened? Was that your first house um, that you did? You get a priest along? What happened? Yeah. Um, it was the very first uh, place that I could call home. It, but I was mm. merely uh, um, staying there. Uh, as a holding position for the owners until they needed it. And um, uh, I was in absolutely dire circumstances. I mean, I didn't have the most basic things that people consider necessary for life. Um, and there were, there, I had two rooms, but I couldn't use the back room because there was a, a very unpleasant presence there. And I would, I picked that up instantly and I thought, no, 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 I'm not going there. So I came home from, from one of my uh, scripture teaching sessions one night in the middle of winter, and I felt the Lord was saying, go into that room, but don't turn a light on. Now to meet a, a foul spirit from a, a different kingdom in the middle of the winter, in the middle of darkness, is not actually anybody's choice experience. But if the Lord tells you to do it, you have to do it because there's something to learn. So I opened the door and the spirit manifested instantly. And <laughs> at the top of my voice, I literally yelled 
Patricio. And I only called the name once. Instantly, Patricio was there. And I could see him, brown habit and all. He always shows his brown habit. He loves his brown habit. And he pushed me aside and said, I'll see to this, stay there. That's what he said. Went in, seconds was all it took. Then he came out and it had this wonderful aroma of tobacco, which um, Padre Pio always, he must have loved the smell of tobacco. I never heard that he ever smoke, uh, but he, he leaves this wonderful aroma of uh, tobacco. And it was, the, it was totally comforting. Now I was in the pitch dark, and yet everything to do with Padre Pio was light. Everything to do with him was light. And afterwards, um, I put the lights on and went into that room and it was fine. And I was able to sleep in it the night before, after. Oh. Never sense. ever had a problem with that room ever again. Wow. And you had uh, a couple of people come and stay with you at this time in life, um, just uh, people who stayed with you in the house. Is that um, okay to share? Well, during those years, those early years, I did a lot of work with um, women who were uh, depressed or uh, had uh, mental problems. Uh, and I learned an enormous amount dealing with them. But um, I, I know it sounds strange to say that I never had a problem with it uh, because um, I didn't have a high opinion of myself. And so when they would insist that the only way that they would talk to you was sitting on the floor, I said, that's fine, sit on the floor. But we had the ultimate experience when on Christmas, I had, uh, was it two of them, I think, as guests for Christmas dinner. And the whole thing had to be put on the floor. So I put the tablecloth on the floor and we put all the food on the floor and we put the human beings on the floor. We put everything on the floor. That's where they felt comfortable. And that was that. But it was, it was, a, uh, it was a journey that I was on uh, into how to um, deal with people uh, regardless of what their personal experience was whether it was prison or whether it was illness, whether it was mental or physical or whatever, or emotional illness, that you would, you would go beyond the, the external and you would touch the interior. You would touch the soul. For example, one of these ladies, um, I won't give names or anything, uh, one of these ladies uh, told me she was engaged to be married. I thought, I must be blind. <laughs> How could you marry someone as depressed as this woman was? Do you know what I mean? She had problems to sell. I said, I thought, no, she has to be exaggerating. You know, I couldn't imagine anybody wanting to marry her in the condition she was in. But apparently she was engaged. Uh, and so I did what I could for her. And finally I said to her, now listen, I have a cure for you. Do you really want to get married? And she said, yes. I said, do you really want to give happiness to somebody else? She said, yes. I said, do you really, really want to get out of this thing? She said, yes. I said, okay, the solution, for you, but you have to trust me. And I took her to a, a special charismatic uh, prayer meeting in which uh, we stood and praised God solidly for either 30 to 60 minutes. It's the most wonderful entry into contemplative prayer that you could ever do because you're getting out of yourself. Everything, you're coming out of your selfishness. And so I told her what we were going to do. And I said, you know, after a while, I will forget you're there. So if you have a problem, I said, dig me in the ribs. So I, I won't remember. And after a while, I got a dig in the ribs. I said, oh my God, she's still there. And I turned to her and I said, are you okay? She said, I'm healed. I said, what do you mean you're healed? <laughs> said, I entered into the praise, she said. And as I entered into the praise, she said, it was like as if a heavy weight began to be lifted off my feet and off my legs and off the trunk and off out, she said, out through my head. She said, it's gone. She said, it's incredible. I feel so light. So um, 
she was married about three months later. Wow, fantastic. That's just one example. There are others, but I don't yeah. want to go on. You bet. <laughs> That you had a conference in Ben Burb in County Almar in 1975. Now, I believe this was this a Protestant Catholic sort of conference and there weren't enough beds to sleep in at the uh, conference centre. And it was quite sort of impromptu, the actual conference. Can you tell us all about this? Uh, what happened? What happened at this very special conference for you? It was a conference of... Uh, Protestant pastors and their families. It had nothing whatever to do with Catholics, except that it was taking place in a Catholic monastery. Um, <clears throat> but I was one of the leaders of charismatic renewal at the time. And uh, the Lord told me to take a busload of Catholics and invade this particular conference. <laughs> <laughs> And the so-called troubles were on at the time. Wow. So the bus would only take us as far as our man. It wouldn't go any further. And so I contacted the Protestant pastor uh, who was in charge. Uh, we all loved this guy. He, he was really lovely. Uh, and uh, I told him what was going to happen. And he said, oh, my goodness. He said, don't do this to me. Don't do this to me. I said it's happening it's happening I said he said how will we recognize you and I said we will uh, march all around in front of the cathedral I said singing all over this place God is moving and he said a lot of our attacks <laughs> and um, so we did that <clears throat> and uh, this line of cars because they had come and collected us came very, very slowly towards us and the doors opened, but the, the drivers didn't get out. <laughs> we piled into the cars, all excited and uh, arrived at the monastery. <clears throat> we had our first meeting that evening. And so the guy in charge, his first name was Cecil. And Cecil said to the crowd, uh, we have a little problem. Jesus multiplied bread, but we have to multiply beds. Uh, and um, he said to me, how many did you bring? I said about 50. And uh, we were sitting on the windowsills because there was no uh, seats for us around the place. And uh, <clears throat> they couldn't handle this thing at all. So I let them go on and on for a couple of minutes. And then I put my hand up and I said, look, Cecil, can I tell you something? We have the solution. And he said, what's the solution? I said, we didn't come to sleep. I said, we're going to pray all night. Forget about it. I said, these people in, in the seats, I said, they paid to come here. They paid for their accommodation. They paid for their food. Let them have it. I said, we don't want it. And they, he said, but did you bring any food? We said, no. He said, no, we can't go with this. And when I said, I said, look, have you got a, a room? Uh, that, that we could use. He said, of course. I said, well, we brought sleeping bags. I said, we'll just roll up on the floor. It's crowd. I said, well, we won't be not using them too much. So that was okay. And then he said, how are you going to manage the food? I said, have you ever heard of a Franciscan? I don't know. <laughs> this was meant to be a Catholic experience on top of a Protestant one. And so <laughs> it was meant to sort of open the thing up. And it was because I was laughing all the time that they sort of, they were sort of saying, you know, you know, what are we going to do? And I said, all of you will sit down. I said, when it comes to breakfast, all of you sit down, take your places, say your grace before meals. And I said, we'll be outside. And we come in, I said, with a, a piece of paper or, or a plate or whatever. And we'll ask somebody for a tiny little bit. I said, that's a Franciscan experience. I said, no problem. And we sit out on the steps. We don't need you, the, the dining room. You can have the dining room. Well, in the end, a, an incredible thing happened. And that was what God actually wanted, was for this new thing to happen. Is that all of a sudden, everybody said, okay, let's talk. Let's give the rooms to the older folks or to the younger people who have got 
young children or whatever. And we, we made a dormitory for men and a dormitory for women who would roll up in their sleeping bags and all the rest of it. Anyway, but I didn't tell them I had brought a priest. And I didn't tell them what our plan was at all. And <clears throat> that night we waited until they were all settled. And we sneaked down into the, the crypt to have mass. And so we went down and unfortunately we started singing. <laughs> we forgot that the singing would carry up, you see. And the incredible thing that happened for hours on end, it was, the, the mass went on for so long, it was amazing. It went on for hours. Um, and gradually, you see, there was a, a, a narrow stairs at the side. Gradually we'd see the, the, the feet beginning to appear and uh, we'd see the legs with the pajamas on them beginning to appear. And gradually more and more and more of the group actually joined us until the crypt was absolutely packed with people and we're all singing the praises of God. None of these people, as far as I know, had ever been at a mass before. Wow. And we, we, we've praised God from about 12 o'clock at night up to 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and from then on, I mean, it was, it was just all grace and all miracle and tr tremendous healing took place. Tremendous. This wasn't the conference where you uh, faced over to Britain and asked for um, prayers no, 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 and no. healing. This was that was a different conference. No, no, oh, oh, totally different. Yeah. That was okay. a, a, was that a, a, a Protestant Catholic uh, conference as well, or that was? It uh, was, yeah, but it was yeah, completely different. Completely different. Completely yeah. different. That was a huge gathering in the RDS. Mm -hmm. And again, the Lord asked me to ask the priest to do something special. Um, the the politicians were trying to um, uh, uh, work out something that was a peace process, and they kept on uh, hitting blank walls all the time. There was blank wall, blank wall. They, they just couldn't break through. And uh, the, the the Lord told me what was needed to break through, and so I told the priest, and I said, "No, I'll join the congregation. If you're the priest, you've got to do it." So at the end of our conference, he asked us all to stand up. There's about 2,000 uh, present. And he asked us all, <clears throat> first of all, in our hearts, to forgive everything that Britain had ever done for Ireland through 700 years. That was a lot of history. And there isn't a family in this country that hasn't suffered, mm -hmm. including my own. Uh, and he said, your heart must be free, absolutely free. You, you can't do what we're going to do next if your heart isn't free. Now we want you to turn to the east, which uh, Britain was in the east, and we want you to raise your hand uh, and in the name of this entire nation, forgive Britain officially for everything, for all of its, all the history between Britain and Ireland. And if you do, there'll be a breakthrough. And there was a breakthrough about two, two days later. Oh. The breakthrough was forgiveness. Amazing. As, long, as long as we would hold resentment or bitterness, there was going to be no break through it you see people have to acknowledge that we're we're a spiritual people mm. uh, and that uh, political solutions are not enough uh, very often a political solution is just what i call plastering you're just plastering over a crack you're not actually dealing with the, the thing um, but to have two thousand people put their hands on their heart and say yes i have forgiven everything therefore i can stand in the name of this nation and forgive. Yes, that has power with heaven. Wow. And uh, we, we need to understand that, you know. And you were very um, clearly involved with the charismatic movement at this time. You were a leader in the charismatic movement. Well, that's why I was involved in that conference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I belonged to a particular group that were called National Advisory Group, uh, generally called NAGS. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But I, I stopped going to the prayer meetings I, and, and I would only just uh, teach the, the scriptures and I'd teach at their conferences, that kind of thing. I, then I began traveling to other countries and giving retreats and all that kind of stuff. Fantastic. And 
Um, so how does how do we bring to the next stage of your life? You, you've you've been, you experienced uh, teaching scripture th throughout Ireland, throughout the UK, and then internationally as well. So uh, you just get more experience teach as a layperson teaching scripture uh, in retreat settings around the world at this stage in your life. Well, a tree develops. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and it matures, and it eventually produces its fruit. You know, because I've I've um, written a number of books and made hundreds of CDs, and uh, I've done uh, an enormous amount of work uh, on television. Uh, I'm the only person who has even attempted to put uh, an entire gospel on television, uh, and so I've put the entire gospel of Luke on EWTN, and the entire gospel of Matthew and John, and now the book of Revelation on um, uh, Shalom World TV. The Book of Revelation won't be aired until next year because they're, they're dealing with the, the Gospel of John now. Um, and the, the effect of putting it on television is incredible. Um, like I just got an email yesterday from an island that I didn't know existed. <laughs> the person asking me, you know, if you don't do this, you're going to have to visit us. You know what I mean? And uh, when you put it on television, it's open to all religions and no religions. And um, I remember uh, getting uh, an email from a lady in another country uh, saying to me that she had found my program accidentally and expected to be totally bored by it. And she said, you caught my attention instantly. Uh, I said I would stay five minutes. She said, now I have watched all the rest of the programs, she said, I was a Jewish person and I'm now a believer. Wow, amazing. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. Well, your, your teaching is absolutely incredible. I've listened to hundreds of hours of it. And uh, to find out more, francishogan.com and also divinewillfamily.org. Very briefly, uh, this is the next stage of your life. How did you find out about the divine will and the teachings of uh, Louisa Picaretta? Was that uh, this? How was it a retreat somebody gave, or how did you find out about it? And that's really the next next sort of stage uh, in your in your life after after this part of your life. Well, that's a long story. <laughs> I have to wait story. till the next interview for that one. <laughs> yeah. That's a long story. I wouldn't like to talk about it in two minutes. You bet. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll have to wait for the next interview. Yeah. But we've we've reached our time now, so I can't thank you enough, Francis. That uh, so many riveting stories. You've had an absolutely fascinating life. And that you've also touched the uh, the lives of so many people, touched the hearts and minds of so many people with God's love. And you know whether that's prisons, whether it's in schools, whether it's in scripture retreats or charismatic conferences, uh, it's just amazing and beautiful hearing how uh, God has used you and your life to touch people all around the world. So we're so grateful for your teaching uh, and also your faithfulness to God and. Your, your fear, your, your response to, to God and your will and to, to design to do God's will in your life. So thank you so much for your time today. And uh, thank, thank you, you all for, thank you all for listening. Uh, a real uh, absolute treasure, Francis. I really appreciate this interview so much indeed. So thank you. And uh, I hope, hope we'll be able to do another interview uh, at some point in the future as well. Okay. God bless. Brilliant. Take thank care. You. Thank, thank you. you so much.